With that wonderful introduction, we will move to Dr. Kahana, who will share with us small molecule inhibitor treatment of basal cell carcinoma. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be here, um, and thank you for sticking through the day to attend this important uh, part of the symposium. I will talk about hedgehog inhibitors. There are currently two of them that are FDA approved, vismotigib and sunitigib. And I should make it very clear, two things. One, this slide deck and the research that I'm doing, I'm doing with the help of a whole team. I'll give all of them credit at the end, but I'd like to give special credit to Dr. Shelby Unsworth, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, who is just a brilliant scientist. She, her PhD is in the biology of basal cell carcinoma, and she's been a, a huge help with uh, taking this to the next level. And I am a consultant, um, and I get research grants from Genentech, which makes Vismotigib. So the problem of a recurrent or aggressive locally advanced basal cell carcinoma around the eye is one that is fairly unique to the periocular region. If you have a basal cell carcinoma on the arm, you just take it out and you have margins and you have a big scar and nobody cares. But if you have it on the face, people care about the aesthetics and if you have it on the, around the eye, you may end up losing visual function. Now, 80% of basal cell carcinomas occur on the head and neck. 20% occur around the eye, on the eyelids and, and canthi. 90% of eyelid malignancies are basal cell carcinomas. And all basal cell carcinomas molecularly are caused by mutations in the hedgehog signaling pathway. Surgical removal can end up with not only disfigurement, but loss of visual or lacrimal function. These are the, the two brand names, Erevege and Odomzo. The drug regimen for Erevege, Vismotigib, uh, is 150 milligrams per day. Um, it does have side effects that I will get to shortly. And um, as a result, there are some non-FDA approved off-label type of uh, drug regimens that include 14 days on, 14 days off, um, every other day, or drug holidays. Since 2013's approval of Vismotigib, which was the first one approved, um, there have been a series of publications on the use of uh, these drugs uh, in the periocular region. We started the um, Visorb clinical trial as a prospective clinical trial. It stands for Vismotigib for orbital and periocular basal cell carcinoma. Everything that I tell you about Vismotigib should also apply to Sunitagib. At the time of the initiation of this clinical trial, Sunitagib had not yet been um, approved by the FDA. This is after nine months of treatment. What you'll end up seeing is that there is clinical resolution, very, very high rates of response to all these advanced or recurrent um, basal cell carcinomas. And much of what I'll show you today is actually unpublished data, including from our histologic and molecular analysis of the tissue from before and after Vismotigib treatment. We developed a visual assessment weighted score because there are actually no good metrics for orbital function. And so this is something that we're still working in part on, and part of the goal of the trial is also to validate this as a tool that could be used for future studies of orbital disease. It includes items such as preservation of the eye, visual acuity, improvement or maintenance, lacrimal function, ocular motility, diplopia, and binocular fusion, and the patient's own subjective assessment of their visual function. When we, uh, we've, at this point, we've enrolled 35 patients, of whom 31 patients have completed treatment. And when we look at the visual assessment score, what we find is that um, the majority of patients either have stable or improved score. Um, a few have minor decline, and basically just one had a major decline. And so we are able to preserve or improve um, visual function by preserving the eye, improving visual acuity, um, maintaining lacrimal function, et cetera. In addition, we've looked now at the histologic analysis, and everything as part of a prospective clinical trial is highly 
um, regulated and uh, standardized so we were able to make statistical assessments. And what we found is that our pathologists will claim that there is no sign of disease in 63%. Disease is present, but the margins are clear, and the majority of these patients underwent Mohs micrographic surgery. Uh, that's 31%. And just one patient still had disease present extending to the margins at the end of treatment. So here are examples of no sign of disease, disease present even though the margins are clear. Clinically, there was nothing there, but there was some residual by histopathology and h &E, and then disease present extending to margins. However, here's a patient that had no, no residual uh, cancer at the margins. After nine months, complete remission clinically, and he recurred two years later. This is the only recurrence that we've had out of the 31 patients so far, but uh, he's also one of the patients that had the longest um, follow-up time. At this point, it's now four years that we've been following him. And the question is how? How do we end up with someone who is read as histologically clear um, getting a recurrence? And so the rest of the talk I'll share with you are data on uh, the molecular and histologic analysis showing that there is hidden cancer that by standard h &E analysis, our pathologists will not see, the dermatopathologists will not read it as positive. But molecularly, I will show you that there is hints of positivity. This is not published, it not, has not yet gone through peer review, so take that with a grain of salt, but I'd like to share this with you so that in your treatment using this FDA-approved drug, you understand that there are some risks associated with it and you need to be very careful. So here, before treatment, this is the h and &E. After treatment, no residual cancer as far as the, hist the pathologist is concerned, and these are expert dermatopathologists at the University of Michigan. And then here we have the recurrent tumor. When you stain with keratin, something that is not usually done, here's the cancer, here's the cancer, and what's this? You know, before, they tell you that this is not cancer. There's no cancer here. They read this as just a typical hair follicle. But it has keratin staining past the basement membrane. So to us, it's highly suspicious for in residual invasive cancer. Here is more, disease present clear margin, extending to margin. What we are seeing are islands of, of keratin positivity. I should mention that these are all at the peripheral margin. They are not at the deep margin. One of the things that the Vismora Gip treatment can really do is clear the deep margin. So that scars and all the cancer basically ends up just at the surface, amenable to surgical resection. But even when the dermatopathologist says there's no cancer there, there might still be some cancer. So how do we prove to the dermatopathologist that these are not just some atypical cells associated with atypical hair follicles? Well, in order to do that, we need to understand the biology of the hedgehog pathway. And very briefly, hedgehog pathway activation causes GLE-1 transcription factor activation and expression. So if you shut down the hedgehog pathway, you should have no GLE-1 transcription factor present. If hedgehog pathway is activated, you'll have GLE-1 expression. That's basically it. It's, it's a switch. It's an on-off switch, and GLE-1 is the final step in that on-off switch. Now, how are we going to look at RNA levels of GLE-1, which is a transcription factor, and RNA levels are at exceedingly low levels when you're dealing with transcription factors. So we ended up using something called RNA scope, which is a technically very challenging uh, tool that Dr. Unsworth became an expert in. And what it allows us to see, I'm not sure, hopefully this translates well into the back, but all these little colored dots are GLE-1 RNA molecules. If you see those brownish dots, hedgehog is active. If you don't see those brownish dots, hedgehog is not active. So here is pretreatment basal cell cancer. GLE-1 is present, as it should be. It's a basal cell cancer. Here it is post-treatment. 
a lot less basal cell, uh, GLI-1, but there is still GLI-1 positivity. This was taken from the patient who was read as histologically clear of cancer, no residual disease present. And you can see that the recurrence is much more hedgehog positive. We're in a sense selected for tumor that was resistant to the vismotigib therapy. So despite complete clinical response, the keratin positive micro lesions are still present in the excision samples. Many of these lesions display hedgehog activity that suggest vismotigib resistance, not just persistence. It's one thing to have persistent tumor that is still amenable to vismotigib treatment, or maybe it's just inactive cells. It's resistant, which means that it can come back with a vengeance. <clears throat> vismotigib provides alternative solutions for patients whose basal cell carcinoma puts them at risk, but the clinical response is not the predictor of complete histologic response. I believe that around the eye, fismodigib or sunidigib are potentially best used as a neoadjuvant. Unless the patient has a contraindication to surgery, we can reduce the amount of surgery, the complexity of the surgery, the consequences of surgery, but we still are gonna end up needing surgery because leaving these patients on this drug ends up selecting for resistant um, elements. So it's essential, even if you just still have microscopic disease, that it is surgically excised before you develop that resistance. And from our experience, that is at somewhere between six months and 18 months that you end up developing experience. Finally, and this is something that we will need to publish in the pathology literature because our dermatopathology colleagues are just not buying that. And we're in, at this point, we are doing the exact genetic profiling. We're actually sequencing every mutation in the hedgehog pathway for each one of these tumors in order to be able to map, fate map, exactly where the tumors come from and their genetic relationship to the original tumor pre vismotic That will be the QED that this is truly the residual cancer that we are saying it is. But what I'm telling you is that based on our data, I believe the HID staining is not sufficient to differentiate between persistent and resistant residual basal cell carcinomas. So I think that this is an extraordinarily useful drug. Um, it is not FDA indicated as a neoadjuvant, but there is a growing body of literature that it can be used very effectively as a neoadjuvant. Our prospective clinical trial at this point with an interim analysis supports that, but there are some caveats that we need to be aware of and not overpromise what this drug can do for our patients. So I'd like at this point, again, to make sure that you understand that it takes a village. This is a prospective clinical trial with a big budget, a lot of expertise that is far beyond what I can do as principal investigators, and these are the most surgeons, the dermatopathologists, the pathologists, the oculoplastic surgeons, the research staff, the clinical coordinators. This has been an incredible uh, journey for me, learning how to run a clinical trial. I'm a PhD basic scientist, and, um, and this is, though, the kind of thing that uh, a clinician scientist is really poised to do. And we're now doing the molecular analysis, and hopefully next year we'll have more information for you. So thank you again very, very much for the opportunity to present.